So please do welcome Antarjot. How do you say it? Oh, Antarjot. Uh, Antarjot. Sorry. That's why I said I'm already bad at it. Car? Car? Yeah. Sure. Antarjot's car. Uh, she's uh, coming from the Department of Engineering Education at Virginia Tech and doing a topic that I think is super important because it's something I struggle with myself on qualitative methods for engineering educators. Um, so Antoja is going to present, I'm sorry, you can reshare your slides now, um, for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the time really just having an open discussion. If you wanna ask a question in the chat because you're not comfortable speaking, have no fear, do that. I am a chatter, so I will. I can ask that question for you, or you can just unmute yourself uh, at any time and be able to ask questions. But the whole point is that instead of this being a seminar where we lecture traditionally to each other, we should take our own active learning approaches and really interact with each other and learn. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Arnta Jo. Um, just to confirm, can you see my slides? You're great. Thank okay, you. awesome. Okay, so today I'll be presenting on qualitative research for engineering educators. Um, my name is Anthur Joe Carr, and uh, just to let you know that this is a short presentation to develop your foundational knowledge on qualitative research and how to begin taking steps towards qualitative research. Students like myself um, and other scholars spend years and years just to understand how to set up and perform good qualitative research studies. So today's presentation is just the beginning of your journey. And so just a little bit about my background is that I have two degrees in bioengineering um, from George Mason University, specializing in medical imaging and devices. Um, and I'm currently at Virginia Tech pursuing a PhD in engineering education, but also pursuing both disciplinary research as well as engineering education research. And so just a little bit about what we're going to go over today. So we're going to talk about what is qualitative research? Why do we do it? Um, how do we do qualitative research? How do we know we're doing qualitative research well? And where can I get more information, so resources? Um, and so just in the chat, a quick question I have for everyone is, what is qualitative research? if you've performed it before and in what context? And I'm gonna give you all like 30 seconds. Okay, so all great answers. Um, and yes, all fall under uh, qualitative research. So awesome job. Um, and so the formal definition given by Cresswell, uh, who is a well-renowned research method specialist, and you can read his formalized definition on screen of what qualitative research is, but really, um, Synthesizing that is this definition means that we want to go beyond the numbers and we want to see and explore other people's experiences in the world. And so in the spirit of exploration, we utilize qualitative research and its methods as a tool to answer what, why, and how questions through different types of non-numerical data to understand concepts, opinions, experiences, so for example, the question that I have is, how do minoritized students experience engineering identity development in their first year BME introductory course? And in this case, we're looking at how the population of minoritized students within the context of first year BME students uh, introductory courses and how they experience that engineering identity or that professional identity development. Uh, and so the way we investigate this can be through, um, and I think a few were mentioned, but interviews, focus groups, reflections, and other sources of data. Um, so just to kind of get clarity on what qualitative research is relative to quantitative research that we're used to, when we're looking at quantitative, when we're looking at qualitative work, quantitative work, we look at the numerical data to understand the breadth of the topic, whereas qualitative work, we're looking for the depth in the topic. So when we're looking at, uh, when we're comparing research questions that we might ask, quantitative research is going to have close-ended um, questions versus qualitative where we're asking those how, what, why questions. Um, with quantitative research, the more the better, um, versus qualitative research, you don't necessarily need as many participants. 
with data collection, um, with quantitative research, we might give out surveys, have validated instruments, or have observations. But with qualitative research, with data collection, we have interviews, focus groups, artifacts. And these artifacts can be different objects, photos, or other things we're asking the participants to bring as another source of data. And so in data analysis, really with quantitative research, what we're looking at is numbers versus qualitative research where we're looking to synthesize themes. Um, and so when it comes to quantitative research, we're really confirming something versus qualitative research, we're understanding something. So um, if we're in a classroom setting, a setting relative to quantitative research, we might take demographic information relative to who's passing, who's failing, versus qualitative research, we might ask questions about why are certain groups of students passing or failing and how can, how are they failing? What are they not understanding? And utilizing that information to see how we can make those environments better for those students. And so really, why do we do qualitative research? Well, it's really, again, to go beyond the numerical data and get a holistic picture. It really adds value because we're able to understand people or um, just an individual person's experience, uh, understanding new areas of understanding, and also getting details about their experiences. And so we know why we're doing it. Now, where do we start? And so we start with a good one or two centralized research questions, um, a good research design, and then thinking about our data collection and analysis process. And so um, how do we do qualitative research? We generally start with picking out a research question or two that's centralized to a specific topic and open-ended. Um, we look at our data collection site and we think about um, questioning the data collection site to see if uh, exploring our research question and the methods that we're using are actually feasible. Where are we getting our participants from? Figuring out how to collect the data at that site, uh, institutional procedures, and where is that data going to be store stored slash how are we engaging with that data? And so we think about also who we're sampling and the positive or negative impact of studying that population, protecting that population, and building rapport with the participants from that population. And so when um, once we do that, we're thinking about methodology. And then it's important to have a systematic methodological process to frame your research question, the steps to your data collection, and the steps to data analysis. So in developing our study, it's important to think about the methodology to ensure we are going about a systematic way of collecting our data that will answer the questions that we are curious about at the end of the day. Generally, when we think about methodology. We're thinking about the five traditions or traditional methods you may have heard of, ethnography, phenomenology, case study, narrative analysis, and grounded theory. I personally stay and have worked in phenomenology because I want to grab the main themes across experiences of students. Um, and the last piece that's critical to a good research design is theory. A theory is an attempted explanation about why something is working or explaining a phenomena of interest and contains different constructs explaining that phenomena. So it's kind of like the glue that fits the puzzle pieces of our um, methods together. So that being research questions, data collection, data analysis, by helping us frame the research question we ask. And so, we essentially use theory in each of these parts as a tool of alignment. And so if we're using engineering identity as a theoretical framework or Godwin's uh, engineering identity framework, we can see that the study is aligned by mentioning it in our research question, using the three constructs to inform the research questions that uh, not only that we form, but also within data collection when we have interviewing questions, um, informing those questions based on that theoretical framework, picking engineering students if we're using engineering identity framework, um, and then when performing data analysis, looking for those constructs in data and finding in, in our findings, mentioning that we found um, these components uh, relative to engineering identity.
And so how do we collect data? So that can be done through a myriad of um, types of data collection processes, whether that's observations, interviews, document review, or artifacts. Um, when doing data collection, it's important to think about uh, ethics. And so the first is working with your institutional review board or IRB to make sure that your study is not harmful to the participants that you're studying. You have the proper IRB training to perform your study and you're securing the data in a location that is safe. The second is consent, making sure that your participants are aware of what they're using and signing up for, um, how their data is being used, and making sure that they know that they have the full right to withdraw at any point to preserve their mental, physical, and emotional well being. It's important to inform them of consent multiple times. On the team that I work on, we send uh, the form of consent before. Uh, then once they sign it, we actually go through and spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about consent in lay terms so that they understand what they're signing up for. Um, the next is de-identification. And de-identification isn't just giving the participant a number or a pseudoname, but it's looking at the different layers of their identity as you're explaining that in your studies or your write-ups, making sure that it is generalized enough that their identities and their location are generalized enough so that no one who's reading your work will be able to actually identify them. And then the last is reciprocity and relationship building. And remembering that the participants of your study are humans who are giving their time and energy to um, share their stories with you. So that means that we need to not only compensate them, but maybe connecting with them and making sure that as we're going through um, our research process, even after our interview, that maybe we're asking them, are you okay with all the information that you shared today? Um, and sharing the articles where their information has been used. And so now we've kind of talked about ethics. So let's talk, and data collection. Now let's talk about data analysis. Um, first and foremost, we need to create a way to manage and organize the data. Then we need to also think about looking for themes in our data through the process of coding, um, then reading our data and organizing it based on those themes that we identified into memos. And once we have finished coding or memoing, we can look at one or more methods to analyze that data. And then thinking about how can we represent this to communicate our findings to other people. And so what is coding and how do we do it? It's not the computer coding that we generally think of, um, but it's a systematic way to label and engage with our data. So these codes can be a priori where we're using um, a theoretical framework or um, other common themes that we might think of that may come into our uh, data set before uh, engaging with our data set or in vivo coding, where as we're going through reading our transcripts, um, we just see emergent codes. And to remember that when coding, it's not just a one and done process, but that we need to be well versed in our data to make sure that the codes that we are applying are appropriate. And so a code book might look like with the a priori. So this is again going with the engineering identity framework, where I took the three constructs of performance, competence, and recon uh, performance, competence, recognition, and interest, and define them so that now I have a reference point every time I'm looking through my data. Oh, I see performance and competence, but this student was talking about performance and competence that wasn't necessarily in the engineering um, content uh, context. So I might say, oh, this might be performance and competence, but it's not relative to my study, so I'm not going to code this as performance and competence. Um, and that's the a priori code book. Now in vivo coding, um, this is just maybe as we're going through that transcript, we're recognizing that students are talking about the rigor of that process. Um, so maybe as students talking about the rigor, they're talking about how they're supported in relationships. They're talking about how even though they have all these qualifications, they're still um, doubtful about their own skills or success. And so um, how memoing is different from coding 
is that now we're kind of looking at our data and actually applying these codes to the data and taking the data to support like, oh, we see rigor um, based on a student saw that, oh, I have to balance my schoolwork, I have to balance my job, I have to balance my family, and that's just the expectation. So it's a, engineering is very rigorous or they were supported by their peers. So they saw that those peer-to-peer -peer relationships were really helpful. Um, and even with imposter syndrome, we're taking different quotes to from the data that we have um, and linking them to these themes. Uh, and so in thinking about how do we know we're doing it well and how can other people really trust the work that we're doing, so we engage with different strategies of trustworthiness um, to make sure that we can defend our work to others and that those in the engineering education community can trust our work. So that can include peer reviewing and debriefing. So in peer reviewing and debriefing, we're engaging with others who we trust to give us feedback, guidance, and validation that we're doing things properly um, or to give us different points of view. Um, triangulation, so that can be bringing in multiple forms of data. So if we're interviewing students, maybe we're also asking them to bring in artifacts um, or we're using document analysis. Um, so just bringing in multiple forms of data, researcher bias and reflexivity. So that's thinking about our own social identities and our biases and how that impacts the research that we're doing, if we are right to do the research that we are doing, um, or if maybe we should be more collaborative because we might be studying a different group that we are not a part of. Uh, prolonged engagement is kind of making sure that you're understanding the culture, social setting, and building rapport with those who are, we are interviewing. And member checking is really like after you've gone through this whole process, but maybe in a transcript you're like, I don't know if this is representing this community or this person correctly, going back to your participants and being like, hey, this is what I'm writing up. This is um, what I'm thinking. Uh, is this valid in what you were trying to say? And so um, generally when building our foundation for resources that um, to just understand general qualitative methods, um, Cresswell that I mentioned earlier actually has a book of qualitative research and design. That's a really good book um, that we here at Virginia Tech actually are introduced to and use in our first year. Um, just to understand the basics of the five traditions, how to set up methods. Um, and then we also do the interviewing. So there are actually a lot of decisions that you make when it comes to interviewing any part or interviewing anyone really, um, whether that's the time you're choosing to interview, the structure of the interview, um, depending on the population, there are so many different choices that you make. So this is a really good um, starter book to understanding how to make those choices. And then when getting into um, qualitative research, maybe not getting into a specific method, but just starting out with thematic analysis to kind of identify themes. And so if you're a little more advanced, um, going into in-depth coding and understanding um, different processes beyond what I had mentioned today, as well as thinking about specific methods that you might align with from those five traditions based on the research questions um, that you want to ask or the places you want to explore. Uh, I personally am based in phenomenology, so I refer to Mustakas a lot. And so our takeaways today are qualitative research is to answer those what, why, and how questions. Um, we need to pick a good research question, a theory, a method, and think about the data collection and storage and analysis process. And we need to have a way to arrange and engage with our data that is organized and systematic. And so thank you so much for listening to my talk today. Um, and if you wish to contact me after this, uh, here is my email.